Hello and welcome to A Piece of String, the show that brings together comedians and scientific minds to ask and maybe answer the biggest of all questions ever. We're still in London, it's still really hot, and we're still not wearing many clothes. I'm Matthew Shribman, I'm a chemist and a bit of a biophysicist, and with me today are Fran Grimes, a biochemist. Hello. James Wells, an engineer. Hello, hello. And Tom Gunter, an aeronautical engineer. Hello there. Each of us will ask a question to which one of us secretly knows the answer, and points will be allocated on a tyro arbitrary basis by our producer, Sam Lee. The winner will get this small orange piece of sugar, which is a small splinter of a mento shell that I'm holding. James, what's your question for us today? What is the best way to remember someone's name, or anything for that matter? I have a confession to make on this, actually, because yeah. I obviously came and I met you, James, when we started this you podcast. Did. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. And I also need to confess that as soon as I shook your hand and you told me your name, I forgot it instantly. Yeah, but I did that to you. I have a superpower yeah. and I took that memory from you. And I do that all I the time. It and it's actually socially sometimes incredibly embarrassing. So I need to work out how to fix this problem because yeah. I often forget straight away. Is it slightly stressful when you first meet someone for the first time? Do you think it just... Uh, and yeah, it's this... like you're worrying about where your hand's going, you know, have I hit, have I hit, have I slid it past their ear by mistake, rather than meeting it firmly <laughs> with their hand. That's a poor handshake. Uh, My yeah. favourite handshake is the one where you duck your thumb down just at the last minute and then you go like between their hand and their thumb because now you've got a more streamlined hand <laughs> all the way up their sleeve. Um, My favourite is uh, you, you keep your hat, you, like your wrist next to your hip. <laughs> <laughs> what an invite them to reach yeah, over they to have you to just come on in oh, you know, so, welcome oh, someone wow. got me with a really good one recently where like i had my hand out and i was slightly distracted and just as i went for the grab they really quickly lifted up their right foot into my hand so i grabbed <laughs> their right foot and shook it <laughs> <laughs> so i was worried about straying onto the answer because i'm not the person who's researched it and maybe this is to do with what they've researched but um I seem to remember someone telling me that when you meet someone new, you are taking in so many different signals um, from that person trying to um, that, that you just overwhelms you. And one of the one of the things that kind of turns off in your brain is is making new memories about things like names, because it just doesn't seem like as important a task at the time. Um, I guess evolutionarily, you weren't trying to get someone's name; you were just trying to figure out if someone was 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 a bit cool or a bit a bit dange. <laughs> but apparently it's about um, sort of if you just try and learn something by rote, um, you can only really hold like three things in your mind. Like if you're just trying to remember some, something about something. What is it, short term memory? Like short term memory is in like if, if you were, if I was to meet you and you to tell me like a whole load of stuff about you, the average person could only really probably remember three of those things at any significant time later. So the key apparently is, is to try and memorize things with pictures because your brain is so useless at kind of just remembering things and just storing them, you have to associate. You have to associate with imagery or smells or things like this. And if you link those things together, it's called encoding, and you stand a much, much better chance of trying to remember something. So the first time you meet somebody, you should immediately think, there's something about you. I'm going to kind of characterize it and, and make a bit of a thing about it. And then that's the image I'm going to remember for you, of you. And then I'll always be able to remember your name. I feel like females are better at associating memories with smells. I think they've got more sensitive sense of smell. Do you think that's evolutionarily? Really? Yeah. No, I think that, that, that is plausible. And that this also, I imagine like sorry. hunter versus non-hunter. So if you are in like, if you're quite static and you're being left at home and you're doing child rearing, you're not on the lookout. So maybe you need to respond to things that are sounds and smells a bit more because you're not constantly looking out or on the move. But that is that a completely is it, is it ludicrous true? suggestion? I don't know. Possibly, that sounds yeah, this, like a possibility. This, on on, on average, I think on average, I think women have better perception of color as well. There have been a lot of um, studies done to show that women generally will have more words to describe colors in their normal vocabulary than that they actually use than than men. Actually, my my wife is a is a buyer for Marks and Spencers. Part of her job, she has to be tested on distinguishing like the slightest variations of shade. Like I look at something, I just think that's green. She's like, it's not green. It's not green at all. And she has to, so every so often she goes in and does a test and they'll put a colour in front and she needs to be able to name what that colour is because it's vital for her job. And if she doesn't do that and she doesn't like, well, then they have to like, you know, retest and, and make sure that she can. It's insane. It's 
Um, I've uh, I've got I've got here um, the Crown Paints Autumn Collection 2014 uh, selection of colours. Good um, choice, which I uh, found on the internet, and I'll just read you out um, the first the first three or four. Uh, the first one's called Neurology. That's kind of white, gray? whitish gray. Yes, correct. Let's see if you can guess <laughs> the rest. Here we go. Okay. Um, economy mints. Hang on, mint. <laughs> mints. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not true. Economy mints. Is it like a kind of terracotta peach color? It's yes. Oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> Yay! Okay. That's really good. Goaded wasp. <laughs> that is that is a shade that of yellow. Is, is that the classic striped yellow? It's yellow, but it's like a dark. Dijon mustard, yellow. Oh my god, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, we're like going a level up. I'm not seeing this. We at are all. going a level up. Thinking you own the BBC. That cannot be the name of a colour. That's the name of a colour. Steely blue. Yes! <laughs> what the hell? Why, how are you doing this? I can actually confirm. I'm standing okay. to find I can confirm that she is not okay. cheating. Okay, here we go. Um, <laughs> tight itinerary. <laughs> Beige mate. No, oh, here we I've go. Lost it. Yeah, it's kind of. That was really tough. It's kind of a plummy, plummy puce. No, well, they've named that wrong. That's what's what? happened there. We found then. Their, their okay, bowl. I'll give you one more. I'll give you one more to redeem yourself. George Clooney's overarm bowl. <laughs> I'm torn now. Actually, I'm overthinking it. I've lost my rhythm. See, it could be like crisp cricket white with a bit of cream. But it could also be green. It's just pretty much green. Yeah. I think you got it back there, Fran. <clears throat> you got it wow. back. Wow. Um, so going back to memory, uh, <laughs> I um, I have quite a, I have quite a strange thing with memory where like I I find that I remember stuff much more easily if it's connected to a map. So often, if I'm really struggling to remember something, then I just get someone to tell me like exactly where it happened. Then all the memories come flooding back. I don't know why that is. Like, it's just maybe because I'm associating it with a picture. So this is a genuine technique. This is something that I read about when I was doing my research about having things like in terms of locations and remembering it relative to places on a map or places relative to another thing. So that is genuinely a thing that works. So you've got a work. proper answer for the quesi. I have, yeah. So let's, let's have it. I think that uh, the thing, you know, as well as pictures, you can do something called stacking. So if you remember a whole load of stuff, you basically have a whole load of imagery and you build up that sort of thing. So, you you know, you might associate something like somebody wearing a crown on their head. And if you want to remember something else about them, you then tie in something else to that. So it becomes a whole uh, sort of series of images tied together one after the other. And our colleague, Beck, was challenged along with me and a few other people to remember as many elements of the periodic table as possible in order. And I just did it by rote, so I just tried to remember them and tested myself and tested myself again and again. She created a story, which was basically using this idea of stacking. So whenever she had an element, she'd think, does it sound like something else? And then there was this hugely long story, which is lo much longer than the elements of the periodic table if you read them out. But she was able to remember well over 100 elements in order. Whoa. Just by using this technique called stacking. And then she, because she could, the story was much more interesting and she remembered the story. So she went through the story in her head and then basically as she went through these stories, she basically brought out the elements. I failed massively. I basically, I, I didn't think I even made it to 20, which is terrible. So the... in the degree that I did, I had to learn all of the periodic table. We just weren't given it, which was ridiculous. Oh but we, we said about starting to learn it and everyone else was just, yeah, as you say, just learning it by trying to cop it out over and over again. And I was thinking there must be an easier way to do this. So I tried to turn it into a word. And so I started reading it and it basically goes, Heli Beb Knopf. And I was suddenly like, oh my God, this is what my dad used to say to us when we were kids and we were like going to, when we were going to sleep or something. It was just like this weird set of, he'd just always say, Heli Beb Knopf, Nanam Gal Sips Clarker. Good night, kids. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you, you didn't question like it. That. And we were like, oh, that's just what he says. Um, but that, 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 that is what it reads if you read the beginning of the periodic table. So I already knew the beginning of the periodic table. That takes you all the way up to calcium. So what's that fourth row or something? Um, and then it yeah. keeps going, Skativ Kruman, Fikoni Kuzan, Gagispra Krubs, Ryza Nub, Mokru Rup Dag or something like that. I can't remember. <laughs> Very good. That is brilliant. Nice. That is absolutely brilliant. So yeah, you need to do this kind of, that's mnemonic. So that's like another method of doing it, like a mnemonic, like a memory device. But yeah, you can get much, much further doing that than you can do just trying to remember something. Mm. Can you say it again? It's just brilliant. Heli Beb Kanoff, Nanam Gal Sips Klarka, Skativ Kruman, Fikoni Kuzan, Gagispra, Bukra, Sarai, Zanub, 
and then it's like Mott Krura Hup Dag or something. I think I'm, I think I'm forgetting it there. Mm. Well, interesting that you would say you've forgotten it. So another thing with memory, if yeah. I may just, um, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, it's something that's really important if you're teaching and especially at teaching just knowledge for retention rather than just understanding. If you want to be really proficient in any subject, there's this theory that you need the knowledge first and you can try and teach lots of skills and lots of high brow or abstract concepts but without some concrete blocks. You're never going to get there. So um, there's this thing called the forgetting curve which states that if the first time you see a piece of information, your retention of it for the first kind of hour after that might be about 100%, but it falls off really soon afterwards. And But really quickly afterwards, if you can kind of picture a half-life graph for radioactivity, so basically a curve that moves very steeply downwards and then tails off and tends to the, to the x-axis of the graph, that is what happens to a memory if you never revisit it for new information. However, you can intercept that curve by revisiting the information really sh um, a really short length of time after the first seeing. So say if you learn, if you read a fact, you wait four hours and you read the same fact again, what you basically do is top up your retention of that fact. And this time your curve is slightly less steep. So it takes you longer to forget it completely. And if you do this over consecutive days or consecutive hours or however long a time frame, the curve gets shallower and shallower so that your base retention is much higher and essentially that that's converted to long-term memory and there's a study technique called the lightner box system which basically capitalizes on this so you make some flashcards or something similar and you test yourself on them and if you get them right you visit them less frequently but you carry on visiting them so you might rather than testing every day test every week every month every year and as soon as you get that wrong, it goes back to really high frequency testing. So you use the testing effect, which helps retain. So you test it every day as soon as you, you get it wrong. It goes back in there every day. Every day. And then, Even oh, if it's so something when you, that you've previously known, been able to store for a year. Yeah. And when you get it right, you move it to a lower priority box. Exactly cool. that. And that's apparently one of the most effective ways to convert short-term memories into long-term memories when it's just factual knowledge. Cool. Fran, you told me something really interesting about taxi drivers. We had a conversation about it, didn't we? We did. So taxi drivers. So the part of the brain that is associated with long-term memory is the hippocampus. And when, so taxi drivers, particularly in London, before we're talking pre-Uber here, but they have to complete a test called the knowledge, which is where they have to know the entirety of the London A to Z. It makes sense. That means you're going to be an excellent taxi driver because you know where all the roads are and routes between places. And that requires, obviously, a huge capacity for memory. So they did a study where they took MRI scans of the brains of taxi drivers and they have larger hippocamp hippocampi, hippocampuses um, than the average person and that their hippocampus gets bigger over time. So as they continue to use those memories and strengthen those connections, that area of their brain is actually physically bigger as well as being more capable than the average person. Cool. Nice. I've got one more really small thing to say about memory. It's just, it's just a bit sad, actually. It's just about collective memory, about how... Um, if you have like a really strong relationship with someone, then uh, then automatically uh, in the relationship, you won't both try to remember all things. So you will store some of your really important memories with that other person and vice versa, which is one of the main reasons why breakups are so painful because you lose, you genuinely lose a part of yourself and people say, oh, it feels like I've lost a part of myself. And you, you have because you've lost all of those kind of memories and all of those connections and associations. Should we have a group hug? Yeah. It's too hot. And you're naked. <laughs> Please. Let's have a group hug. Thanks. <laughs> uh. Tom, you got a question for us? I do. Do fish get thirsty? Mm. Yeah. Done. Die in fruit. <laughs> what is well, it? they're always getting buttered. <laughs> Ooh. Um, what is thirst? Like, it's so weird, isn't it? You're like, oh, I'm thirsty, but I can't. I couldn't tell you like why. It's, it's like a bit of a dry. You could say a bit of a dry mouth. I've had dry dry mouth before, like because I've just left it open. You know, so it's no, not, the, not because oh, not you because I'm thirsty. So what is it? Just what is gawping. It? Or have you ever been like? Oh, uh, you don't know whether you're hungry or you're thirsty. It yeah, so you're just thirsty. Usually thirsty is the answer yeah. to that question. Yeah. I know that you have this hormone that we secrete called leptin, um, which, which we which we release. How as, did it get in there? 
Wait. Ah, uh, now I get it. I'm so bad at puns. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, leptin is this hormone we secrete um, when we needn't be hungry anymore, um, I think. Uh, and I know that the fish don't really have, like, an analog of leptin uh, or some fish. And so some fish will just continue to eat as long as food is available, which means that you can very easily, like, overfeed fish to the point of their their death. So you, like the thing about like thirst, like what is thirst? That's like a, it's like an innate need, isn't it? To, to drink, but brought about by the fact that if we don't, we'll die. So your body is sort of telling you, right, you need to drink like a reaction. So that's like that desire, that feeling is like an evolutionary thing saying, right, you need to do this right now because if you don't, you're going to die. So ah. it's a question of whether fish, no, sorry, it's a question of whether like do fish actually f- have that kind of same evolutionary need? to actually drink. Well, how do they even absorb water? I don't really know how it works. I assume it just like seeps in through their eyes or something. Through their eyes? <laughs> Has anyone ever done that? Tried to drink alcohol through one of their eyes? And are eyeballing it? Uh-huh. No, you haven't actually. I haven't. It does work. Yeah, it apparently it's work. meant to be quite quick because you've got quite a good blood supply, I think. Mm. And it's meant to be getting... Rather than... Short diffusion pathway. Indeed. So fish, is. do you think fish... They eyeball the water, basically, yeah. Yeah. And I think if we think about the movement of water, so water will always move, um, unless under pressure, will move from an area of high water concentration or low solute concentration, so that's when there's not many other things dissolved in the water, to where there is not as much water relatively, and that's called osmosis. Um, so it basically moves to where it's salty. Exactly. Yes. Um, or sugary, or any other kind of dissolved substance. So you would think that... A fish surrounded by water, its blood will have a lower water potential. It'll have less water in it than the water around it. And therefore, water you might expect to move into the blood of the fish. Yeah, so or f- into the fish. Wait, oh, do you think we are talking about thirst for water? I thought we were talking about thirst for like power. Have I got the wrong end of the stick? <laughs> yeah. How could you rise up a fish society? How could you become, if you were were a lowly salmon and you were at the bottom of the the pack, the pack of salmon, it's a pack, right? If you're the bottom of the pack, how do you rise to the top? How do you become the alpha salmon? Education in schools. That's why fish are always in them. No, no, no. You you beat up the biggest fish. That's Mm, what you do. Cod's wallop. (laughs) Yeah. You beat up the biggest fish and then you rise to the surface. Not literally. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Definitely make sure you go to school, I guess. Yeah, James, what are you thinking? Uh, I'm thinking, who's going to answer the question? (laughs) Okay, here we go, everyone. Um, So, uh, firstly, I was just thinking about um, bladders. So obviously, you know, when we get rid of our water, we, or, well, excess water, we'll store it in our bladder, we it out, um, and fish have bladders, but they're swim bladders, which means they're not, they don't actually use them for, for urine, Instead, their swim bladders are full of air, um, which uh, they compress if they want to sink and they loosen if they want to float. Because obviously you can compress air to make it more dense and that makes the fish overall heavier. Or you can like loosen it to make the fish less dense and then it floats up to the surface. So they use their bladders not for weeing, but for going up and down. Um, and in terms of getting rid of the stuff that we would get rid of in our urine, they just let it all out straight through their skin. So, um, fish just release ammonia through their skin directly, which is part of the reason why fish smell, why fish market smells so bad is because the fish are essentially all covered in their own urine. Um, anyway, then I was thinking about, uh, how, you know, obviously we call it a bladder, but actually we think that swim bladders in fish are where the first lungs came from because the lung fish, um, it's, it's lung is kind of an adaptation of its, of its swim bladder. Um, and obviously the, yeah, the lung fish is, is, uh, one of the most primitive creatures that we know of, uh, that is kind of like a fish, but looks like it started to develop these lungs that it can use to breathe on land. Anyway, to fish and water. (laughs) Um, So as I said in episode one of A Piece of String, yes, fish always come to the surface to drink (laughs) when it rains, um, which was a lie. So (coughs) freshwater fish um, 
absorb water through their gills and their skin. They, they have no active need for, for gaining extra water. And in fact, if they were to try and drink water and to put it into their stomachs, um, then that would dilute their blood too much and they might die. Um, but saltwater fish get thirsty all the time because they're constantly losing water through their gills because it's flowing out into the saltier ocean. And maybe it's happening through their eyes as well. I'm not actually sure about that. Um, so therefore, they need to drink constantly and they have really, really active kidneys that are constantly pumping out loads and loads of salt, which again is why... Um, it, well, that, that's, that's part of why fish taste so salty because they have so much salt that they're trying to release into, the, into their surroundings. Um, as in salt, salt water fish. Um, and then I was thinking about salmon uh, and how they obviously go between salt water and fresh water. And so when they switch to the salt water, when they switch to the fresh water, they just stop drinking and they just switch off their kidneys a little bit. And off they go. Um, but yes, uh, as Tom was touching on, uh, yeah, they we don't think they ever get thirsty because that's kind of like a conscious decision to drink. Um, and it doesn't really make sense that fish would ever need that conscious decision. And in fact, we know that the, um, drinking, uh, that drinking for them is a reflex. It's, it's not part of their, their decision making brain because they would never need to like go to water to get a drink or would they? Um, and that might be one of the evolutionary barriers that slowed down the first creatures that were like crawling out of the sea trying to get onto land because something will have had to have evolved that could not only breathe on land and do, do all of these other things, but also would know that it had to go to water to get a drink rather than it being a reflex. I reckon the fish will be hot and thirsty today though, don't you think? It's hot enough for even a fish to get a thirst on. And now for the mystery midsection. Just before we started the show, I gave everyone the following question. What is a gribble? I then asked everyone to write down a fictional but reasonable sounding answer. I will now read out all of those answers with the real answer mixed in. Everyone will then get the chance to decide which answer they think is right. A gribble is a medieval term for a tool used to sew leather goods. A gribble is a little critter that eats wood at the bottom of the sea. A gribble is a compound word referring to the dribble of gruel or soup or broth. It is so called as gruel, in brackets, gruel drool, was too similar to gruel to be distinguished. A gribble is a microscopic hook on a bird's feather that connects it to adjoining feathers. A gribble is a minor argument between a married couple the reason for the gribble is not actually understood by either person, but it escalates quickly. What do you think, Fran? <clears throat> I see ya. Birds and feathers. See ya thinking. You think? Know thine enemy. I hate birds. I'm going birds and feathers. Birds and feathers. Straight in. I think it's the medieval tool. I think they had very, very strange names. I think that sounds appropriate. Um... I just want a full episode mix of just James thinking. Just <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> um, critter at the bottom of the ocean that eats wood. Now, I can't imagine that there would be much wood down there, really. Whoa, not even on with loads of shipwrecks and that. Like, Maybe there's just a few of these little critters. Maybe they they've got enough food. Keep the population Maybe of the ships fine. down, otherwise it gets too high. That's Once they start breeding, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that's a bit silly sausages. I'm going to go with the uh, feather as well as Fran. Well, oh, God. you'll all be pleased to know <laughs> that I won again. <laughs> Uh, for the f my I fake answer, <laughs> my fake answer was the the microscopic hook on a bird's feather that connects it to adjoining feathers. Don't know what that is. Does it even exist? Who knows? Probably. Um, does it? Do they have hooks? Absolutely not. They no. actually have like strands attached together, don't they? Yeah, it feels like they've got hooks that you tear it, apart it's if like you Velcro, like. It must be. Yeah. Um, who came up with the medieval tool? That was James, right? Oh, that was me. So a point for James. Yes. Um, and the real answer 
was, of course, a little critter that eats wood at the bottom <laughs> of the sea. Um, in fact, um, the enzymes that they produce, um, we think, could be one day mass produced to convert wood to sugars for a biofuel because they're so efficient at converting wood. Um, I also thought it was quite interesting that um, these these creatures can't really survive very well in brackish water. Um, so you get you get creatures that digest sunken wood well in salt water and fresh water, but in brackish, which is like in between salts and fresh, um, they can't really survive. Which is why you've got the Vasa in Sweden. Do you know what the Vasa is? No. The, the Vasa is this amazing museum in Sweden, which is built around this, this boat called the Vasa. So about 400 years ago, the king of Sweden was like, come on, guys, build me a really sick ship. Um, and they spent a long time building this incredibly ornate ship with loads of gold and like beautiful carved statues and things. Um, but this was back in the day that the mathematics of ships was not really done very well it was a lot of it was just like dead reckoning and so um they just popped the ship on the water uh set it out to sail and within a kilometer it just capsized the whole <laughs> thing went down um and it was only discovered later in the um it was only discovered later in ah, and it was only discovered later in the 1900s um before i mean it was about to be used as a dumping ground for loads of shipyard rubble and someone was like hang on a minute this could be something good and then they pulled it out and it was comp almost completely immaculate almost no degradation at all because the area of water that it was in was brackish. No gribbles about. Honestly, great museum. Go and check out the Vasa. I just can't believe there's enough wood down there to keep yeah. it all going. Yeah, yeah, You're yeah. mad. So many ships have sunk. Come on. No, it's just that there are, no, there are very, very few wooden ships now. So are they running out of food? I'm concerned for the plight of the gribble. Don't know why you guys think that gribbles have to be eating ships. <laughs> just like, there's plenty Where of, plenty else of does wood, wood come from? <laughs> it's wood just going into the ocean, just growing up there, the beginning of its life as well. Mm. Bit of mangroves. Then you got your um, eat pineapples, palm trees that just like float out, and sink. Yeah, they love pineapples, gribbles. Coconuts. All over them. Must be loads of coconuts out there. Mm. Yeah, my precious cargo of coconuts. <laughs> Famous uh, Anthony Hopkins line. Oh. oh, I see. I thought you just. Yeah, I thought that yeah, was just. I was just a... yeah. Or I could be lying. Mm. Should we crack on? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we finished this one, and we were just like, <laughs> we're just "Are we still recording?" So no, let's milk it as long as we can. Let's milk it dry. <laughs> I've got a question. What's the chance that you, or me, or anyone for that matter, will look similar to your sibling? And um, what about when people look like their dogs or dogs look like their people? Yeah. That's my favourite. What dog would you be? I know exactly what I would be. Wait. Um, okay, James, Border Terrier. Are you mad? Thank you very much. Irish setter? Yeah, Irish Are those setter. flaming locks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take it all back. Uh, Irish Setter was probably the dog I was thinking, oh, I just don't know what a Border Terrier is. Just went for it. I'm going to look it up now. I just wanted to say something just in case no one else had any ideas. Uh, uh, Tom, I think you would be... Oh, not a Border like Terrier. A... No, yeah, Irish Setter, sorry. Yeah. Irish Grand. Setter, 100. is that what you were thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you would be like a... What are those German pointy dogs? Are they called pointers? Alsatian. No, 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 no. Even no, no. Even Too pointier. much fur. Even pointier than that? Yeah, really a pointer. Point. Yeah, you're a pointer, but like they're quite tall and lean. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, I can't like, vi can't visualise it too much, so I'm not going to take offence. Okay, go for a whip. I'm, 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 I was thinking Spaniel. Yeah, I was, Possibly I was thinking Spaniel. Spaniel. I was thinking Manu for, for Matthew. Fran, I think you'd be a Chihuahua, mate. Uh, wow. You... Okay. Uh, I was just experimenting with the most offensive thing you could say to someone within yeah, this conversation. I think you've nailed nah, it. I think you'd be a nice golden retriever, Fran. It's obviously the answer. Yeah. I'm a golden retriever. Yeah. I, you would be um, like a Labradoodle, I think. Oh, thanks. I prefer to be a Cocker Spaniel. The big ones, though. I, I Not thought, the little I, ones. I, I a working Cocker Spaniel, one that goes out to work. Gun dog. Anyway. anyway. Yes. Uh, what, were we, what was this question? Chances you look it. like your sibling. Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I know cousins who look very similar to each other, but not necessarily within. So the siblings don't look very similar, but there are cousins of ages that that look very, very similar. 
I guess it makes sense, doesn't it? Because you've got all these um, bits of genetics that can, for, for one reason or another, skip generations mm. um, and be, yeah, split between different different cousins. When you're born, supposedly, you're meant to look like your father. So at one point, <laughs> if everyone, which apparently is evolutionary, so that the father wouldn't disown the child. So you're meant to look like your father in some way, which I, I find quite That's difficult. Silly. Yeah, so basically, you know, the father, in order to say, like, this is my child would there would be some sort of inherent similarity between the baby and the father so that mm -hmm. the father would kind of stick around and not think that it was not his oh, um so at some point at least when you're very very young supposedly we've all looked like our fathers which i find quite strange but mm. given that they all look like churchill then that's <laughs> <a bit> odd <laughs> <There's>... babies or fathers <laughs> he did have a lot of kids, always <laughs> pleased <laughs> it's always pleased to see the baby come out <laughs> Um, <laughs> I, uh, did you know, so you, you know, epigenetics is, uh, is this thing where some of your genes are turned on and off depending on the, the circumstances around you. Mm. Um, so some of the epigenetics that you might have now, um, could be dependent on conditions that your grandmother experienced your maternal grandmother mm -hmm. um because your maternal grandmother um had uh your mother inside her and inside your mother were the eggs that were already developing that were one of which would one day will one day lead to you um and so if your grandmother went through a period of being really hungry for example or always under a certain kind of stress then that might pass down some kind of epigenetic fingerprint to to you Although there aren't many epigenetic things that that um, that can be passed down in that way, but there are and they few. can change through your life as well. Can't yeah, they? Like, uh, yeah, of your, course, yeah. Your stresses and non-stresses, indubitably. Mm. So, has anyone got a little answer to this? I've got a cheeky little answer, uh, potentially. So, uh, well, for, <laughs> so first of all, let's talk about humans. Um, there's supposedly a, a strong link between between uh, altruism and uh, looking similar to someone, uh, which is interesting. People have observed this. And so often, uh, siblings that look very similar to each other, there's this, they say, slightly closer connection. Now, obviously, that is going to be completely variable, but on average, um, there's this sort of sense. And so to look like your sibling is, is, a, is a good thing in terms of uh, looking, looking after each other over the years, you know? Is that altruism then? Because you're essentially looking after people who look more like yourself. So is that more inherently selfish? Ooh. I wonder. Yeah, yes. I mean, I guess, yeah. Like selfish genes daily. We're Dawkins, talking, what you think, yeah. mate? You know, I know you're listening. In another, in another episode, yeah. A lot of the altruistic things come from selfishness, don't they? Um, but still, I mean, I guess effectively it is more altruistic, isn't it, that you are then looking after your siblings, even if it's based on selfish principles. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Um, there's evidence that monkeys uh, will often go and beat up other monkeys that look similar to the monkeys that have beaten them up. Oh, so they recognise it. They almost recognise the siblings of someone who's done a dirty deed to them. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Uh, so presumably they have some way of, you know, they're, they're, they're fairly advanced critters, so they, they can recognise things like that. It almost has this weird link to like, you know, if you look back at the oldest civilizations and you look at their legal codes and for, if someone in your family has done some kind of error, then someone else in your family could be punished for it, as if like the family is the... Is the unit. Mm, yeah, like a generational curse sort of yeah. thing. Anyway, sorry, James. Yeah, no, cool. Um, and I don't, I can't remember why I've noted this down, but uh, it's just a thing called social mirror theory, which is um, the idea that you can only understand yourself through the perception of others of you, if that makes sense. So once you understand what other people think of you, you can then inform a more correct idea of what you actually are, which is kind of strange. Um, so this idea of looking like someone um, is helpful. I can't remember why that's linked. I just thought it was cool. Um, so uh, I read a little paper. And if you were to get a load of people to say, how similar do these two people look? And then to also answer the same question, do you think they're related? There's actually a log relation between the two. So that as, as they get more similar, they get in very much more increasingly likely to be siblings, which is an interesting thing. So our perception is skewed towards understanding whether sort of definitely they are siblings or not. There's like an innate need to know whether mm. things are siblings. Ah, uh, so, so what you're saying is that people are unlikely to guess wrong. Um, if they're like, these people are definitely siblings, then they're probably right. Yeah, correct, yeah. yeah. 
Um, which is not that surprising because if people look very, very similar, they're very likely to be related. But it's interesting that we're wired that way to skew it, not just linearly, mm. but log. So that's kind of cool. Um, so in terms of like stats, so one in 400 people are twins as or however that works. Two in, one, two one in 800. <laughs> one, one in 400 births have twins in, <laughs> I suppose. Something like that. Um, so you're relatively rare, I would say, Matthew. Did you know that in Benin or Benin, um, the West African country, um, there there is a much, much higher rate of twin births than anywhere else in the world. Um, and also uh, the local voodoo religion um, in, in that twins are extremely sacred. Like if you have twins and one of them dies, then then you have to get like a wooden model of the one who's died made and the parents have to look after it until both twins come of age and then they can finally stop to, to avoid like bringing a curse upon the upon the village or, or something. Um, but there's this, this, this quite interesting, this thing has not been proven on a, on a large scale, um, but there is some evidence that actually uh, the people... Um, who live there, the, the native people of the region, if they move away from the region, um, then for some reason the twin rate drops. For them, when they've for moved them. away? Yeah. Why? Crazy. Why would that be? Um, again, this this might just be like a quirk of really bad statistics, mm. um, but the the idea there is that is that it's not just a genetic drive of having twins, but perhaps there's something to do with this, with this um, psychological idea that it's better to have twins. I don't know. Very cool. Wow. So the real reason I uh, sort of put this question in the uh, mixer is because I wanted to talk about armadillos. Let me give you some weird little facts about the little guys. So they can inflate, they can inflate their intestines in order to cross rivers. And they can also hold their breath for six minutes so they can crawl underneath a river all the way across. But why am I talking about this? I love it. Don't they mind. have... <laughs> They almost always give birth to four identical twins. No. Whoa, Wait, what, quadruplets? Guys in quadruplets. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my Absolutely God. Absolutely bizarre. So it's kind of strange. So after a year of after being born, they can start to have children. And then for about 15 years or so, um, they have one sort of litter every year. And it's always identical twi- identical quadruplets, yeah. So they're all, every single one of them is identical to each other genetically? Uh, yes. But then doesn't that lead to like, like a sort of very, very well, lack of diversity genetically, which is actually for a species is quite a bad thing, can be like catastrophic. If- yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. Like I, I was reading around that sort of thing because I have the similar thought. And one sort of idea is that when you get it right, you want to keep it right. Mm. And so actually there can be an advantage to not having genetic variability sometimes because you've already found the solution and you don't want to muck it up. Now, that seems like a bit of a wishy-washy answer to me, but I think they're genuinely quite confused by why this happens. It's a bit of a quirk in the way that the embryo implants onto the uterus, which is essentially gets fertilized and then it just waits for a few months and splits into four in that sort of time and then implants and then bang, off you go. So yeah, that's kind of cool. Very cool. So if you're an armadillo, you're very likely to look like your siblings. Fran, you got a question for us? I have. I want to know why belly button fluff is always a dark colour, even when your clothes are light. Wow. So this is always the case for me. Always the case for me. My belly button fluff is always blue. Where do you buy your belly button blue. fluff? Blue. Blue. Yeah, mine's always blue. Like sky it's blue. Sky, no, dark blue. Sky dark blue. blue. Like a navy blue. Um, all good clothes retailers. Okay. Is it a good. political party thing? <laughs> no, it's not a it's not a conscious choice. I just look down and there it is, blue, staring back up at me, regardless of what I've been wearing. Yeah. So, anyone I'm else? currently belly button fluff free, but that might be because it's fallen out. Because you don't have a belly button. Yeah, exactly. Right. Famous, Adam, famously. is that you? <laughs> I was a clone. <laughs> you were a clone. That is cool, isn't it? In Blade Runner, they're always you know looking at the eyes and doing all the tests, like blah blah blah, to see if they've if they're a replicant, surely you just check out their belly button. If they don't have a belly button, they must be a... 
But do you think they foresaw that and built them in, maybe? Yeah, they might they have done. built in. Yeah. And obviously you can, on Amazon, you can get belly buttons delivered. You can't yeah. actually do that. But you can get um, like replacement uh, nipples. Uh, it will like stick on stick on nipples that look really realistic. On Amazon? Yeah, because obviously there are some people who've, who've lost their nipples in wow. surgery and stuff. People um, who bought nipples also bought... <laughs> what else would that be? I think... You who glue like, or something. Um, like <laughs> revealing underwear of kinds, you know, where you get yeah. kind yeah. of brizziers that have bits missing. If I'd bought the nipples, I'd want people to see the nipples I bought. <laughs> also, uh, I assume you wouldn't have the same kind of shame as well because it's not part of your body anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not like, oh, I've slipped a nipple. It's like, here's just a sticker on my top. Mm. Yeah. Different so, nipples for different And different colours, maybe. Mm. Mm. Oh, imagine what a funeral nipple would be like. Droopy. A sad sad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a concept, again, I've never thought about a particular type of nipple used for a particular event. <laughs> <laughs> so you stick them these on. Are my, these are my dancing anywhere. nipples. <laughs> yeah. Good. Um, so is formal. anyone is anyone here scared of belly buttons? No, I know I've met I've met people that 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 are quite frequently. The, the thought of like being like touching the belly button absolutely horrifies them. Well, well there's that phallus. sort of link, isn't there? That old link from when you're a little bambino, isn't there? To your sort of urinary tract. Mm. So often, a lot of people get a weird sensation in the uh, in no. the wee area. You know? Wow. Yeah. Oh, cool. So that's an old old sort of sufferer. Of that. Suffer of that? Yeah. Yep. So when you touch yeah, your I get a little tingle. You a Give it a go, guys. Give it a go. Do you get some little I actually don't want to exactly what it feels like. It nah. might be different for a... <laughs> I wish I did. Women, I don't know. No. Um, but yeah, the fear, the fear of belly buttons is called omphalophobia, I think. Um, but it, we um, there's a pub quiz that I go to sometimes, which isn't really a pub quiz because it doesn't really contain much... much um, What's what, actual man? quizzing. Did you just say? I was gonna say, <laughs> I was gonna say much content. <laughs> um, well, it's just quite weird. Like the, the best way to score points is to um, y- there's a point when when you just have to like invent a game, and and if and if your game gets chosen, then then you win loads of points. So we invented this game where the quiz host had to put a blindfold on, um, and then put her finger into one of our team members' belly buttons, and then. We all, and then she took the blindfold off, looked at all of our belly buttons and tried to decide whose it was. Which was a really good game, obviously, but she, she couldn't handle it at all. So she knew it wasn't you, I presume. Well, she, I mean, she didn't want the game to be the one that won, but all the audience voted for that mm-hmm. one to be the... Mate, this pub quiz is absolutely mental. Like there was this one time... I probably shouldn't go into this on the podcast episode. Go on, Fran, what were you going to say? I was going to say, in a spookily similar but more gross game, I find belly buttoning... I suppose. Um, an old housemate of mine uh, that I did teach training with, he has, Phil here, Matt, sound of, what, what's the phobia? Uh, omphalophobia. He has omphalophobia. And he hates things being in his belly buttons, but he also hates cleaning it because he hates like, the feeling of something inside it. So we used to play bum or belly button. Where <laughs> he would dip a finger into one of the above blindfolded hold it under your nose and you have to say which one it was we always guess bum and it was always belly no. uh, to the point where he did it once we were, I was, we were walking around Marks and Spencers and we were in the cheese aisle and he dunked and shoved his finger in our other friend's nose and she honestly has PTSD she can't go in that aisle because she knew she was nearly sick she was like oh and we could never return to that Marks and Spencers cheese aisle that's the most harrowing tale I've ever heard. I'm, I'm speechless. Shell shocked by that. <laughs> I don't know how to process. I'm really tempted to name check him in case this ever gets big enough for that to matter, but don't worry, Connell. Stays a secret. Bum or belly button? Give it a go. Let us know how you get on. <laughs> <laughs> At String Podcast, we want to know. We want to know. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so yeah, did anyone uh, research the answer for this? <laughs> yeah, I did actually. I had a look at this. And um, before I go into it, I have to ask you, apart from you, Matthew, obviously for obvious reasons, what colour uh, garments are you wearing below the waist? Black for Fran. Uh, a faded black. Okay, and I am wearing a pair of blue shorts and Matthew is not wearing anything. So um, the answer to this really is that belly button fluff doesn't actually really come mostly from your the clothes you're wearing on the top. It actually migrates. Belly button fluff <laughs> migrates <laughs> from ridiculous. various locations around your body. So <laughs> I um, have worn those gloves. Now, this, driven by what madness? <laughs> driven, 
So Coriolis if, force. <laughs> I want craving. <laughs> <laughs> the desire to get to the belly button. We must climb. The um, trade winds. If you are, yeah, if you are a... <laughs> <laughs> Climbing up the snail trail, so it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely true. So if you are a hairy man, and particularly if you are a fat hairy man where your skin is in quite close proximity to your clothes, your hair... Are you sticking with man because of the extra hairiness? Because of the extra hairiness. Yeah. It's mostly fat middle-aged men that have an enormous amount, which is sad for me because I get quite a lot. Um, but yeah, it, apparently the, the hair scrapes off the fibres from all over your legs and various other parts of your body and so long as there is a trail of hair for it to take as you walk it will basically work its way up towards your belly button <laughs> and so the reason that most of it is blue is because most people wear blue coloured under like lower garments so so so, <laughs> That's so somebody so somebody guy, a guy called Steinheiser did some research into this. He's the one that found this out, basically by tracking various bits of fluff as they moved around the body. What do they he, use to uh, track the fluff? So I, I don't... GPS. Yeah, 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 yeah. Video. <laughs> just every so often take it out and just have a look. But he also, um, sh- he was quite hairy as well. So he shaved a little circle around his belly button and had no <laughs> belly button fluff when he did this. But he did have fluff around the circle that he had shaved as it tried to make its way across. <laughs> <laughs> so your belly button fluff, when you look at it, I give it some credit, it has been on an epic journey. An epic, epic journey. Wow. <laughs> Could you say the fact really? about the guy with the red fluff? <laughs> oh yeah, no, there is. It. Yeah, no, there is. A, there is actually, so there's loads, obviously I've been reading like various forums and there's a guy that's written on it who's from Australia, I forget his name, but he's basically written in. He's collected his fluff every single day since 1984 and has the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest collection of belly button fluff. But his is all red and he doesn't wear red clothing and nobody knows the answer. So it is a mystery. So the Guinness Book of World Records for the most amount of belly button fluff owned, it's all red. He doesn't wear any red clothing. And that I don't know the answer to. Well, if you go and visit this man and you find out, then uh, get in touch with us. That's Drink Podcast. We would like to track him down. Wait, we can easily track him down, can't we? Yeah, if you, yeah we will track him down. In fact, if you're listening to this, please get in contact. Let us know why your belly button fluff is red. Maybe send us a photo. Many thanks. And we have arrived at the end. Points have been allocated by our producer, Sam Lee, according to a system that none of us understands. Sam, what's the verdict? Yes, well, having received the fluff contents of each of your respective belly buttons, I'm delighted and revolted in equal measure to reveal this week's scores awarded by weight of fluff retrieved. Uh, James and Matthew, you tied joint third with an ounce apiece. Good hygiene, boys, but it won't win you points this time round. Uh, Tom claims a manful second with two and a half pounds of denim lint, blue jean aficionado, such as you are. Uh, but it's Fran who takes home the prize today of a full knitted cardigan <laughs> woven from retrieved fluff of such technical a dream coat variety as to put one in mind of Andrew Lloyd Webber. <laughs> Great work, Fran. For now, thanks to Fran Grimes. Thank you. Tom Gunzer. Thank you. James Wells. I thank you. Matthew Shrubman. That's me. Our producer, Sam Lee, and to Unbound for their generosity in hosting and supporting us. You can follow us on any of our social media channels by searching A Piece of String or String Podcasts. And if you'd like to learn about many and various scientific curiosities from a man in a bath or otherwise located, you can follow me on social media by searching Science in the Bath or Matthew Shrubman. If you have a quirky question of your own that you'd like a scientific answer for, then please reach out to us on any of our social media channels. Thanks for listening. Please rate and review us. We'd love to hear what you think. And we'll be back again in a fortnight. And as usual, let's never speak of any of this ever again. <laughs>